Hello, everybody. Welcome back into another episode of the Penn State 365 Podcast. My name is Don Count Crow, beat writer, recruiting analyst at Happy Valley Insider of the Rivals Network covering Penn State Athletics. I'm joined by my co-host, as always, colleague Mario Leap at Happy Valley Insider, and then our resident super fan uh, and good friend Anthony Azan. Gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. It's been a long time since we all recorded together. Our schedules have been quite crazy over the last few uh, weeks, but Finally get to sit down, talk Penn State football again, talk uh, quite a bit. I mean, this is a super episode. I'm sure it's going to go over an hour long. We're going to try to keep it as short as possible, but no one else is going to go quite a long time. So uh, if there's listening, perhaps you're listening to us while you're out in presence, uh, cleaning the house before family comes over this holiday season. Perhaps you're driving somewhere uh, to work, to family, wherever it may be. Uh, Hopefully you have a nice reflection here. If you're driving, hopefully. Ah, oh, that's the good stuff. There it is. Wow. <laughs> and we're back to recording. All right. So hopefully and we're off to a crack and start. We're off seconds. to a crack and start. <laughs> I, but I'm just going to pick up where I left off. Uh, if you're driving, listen to us. Uh, have a nice soda, water, something. Hopefully not anything uh, alcoholic while driving. Of course, we do not condone that. But. Sit down, relax, listen to us here for the next hour, hour and a half talk. Uh, quite a few things. We're going to talk Tom Allen being hired as Penn State's defense coordinator. Talk about guy, those who have declared for the NFL draft, uh, who we're still, still waiting for decisions on. Uh, the transfer portal, what's going on there. We're going to break down the 2024 recruiting class for Penn State that officially signed on uh, Wednesday, a drama-free a uh, signing period for Penn State for the most part. A little drama here on Thursday, but that's about it. And then Penn State picks up a commitment in the 2025 recruiting class already. Uh, well, another one, I should say, that I believe is commitment number seven of that class already, perhaps number eight. Um, but a lot to talk about here. Let's dive right into it, gentlemen. We're, we'll start with the biggest news story of the last week or so. Tom Allen hired as Penn State's next defense coordinator, replacing Manny Diaz, who left for the Duke job. Allen, of course, was the head coach at Indiana for uh, the last six, seven years, uh, has been at Indiana for nearly a decade. Uh, you know, maybe not the sexiest hire Penn State could have made here, but I think it's a good and safe hire, to say the least. Uh, Anthony, I'll start with you. What's just your thoughts on the hiring of Tom Allen? <clears throat> like the hire. I think it's a safe hire. I think it makes sense for Penn State. Allen fits the defense that James Franklin likes to run, that Brent Pry and Manny Diaz have both ran over the past, whatever, decade that they were, you know, combined both here on the 4-3 model. I think Allen runs a little bit more of a 4-2-5 as well at times, which I think Manny did quite a bit over the last couple of seasons. He's an aggressive style of defensive coordinator, which again, I think the Penn State fan base has fell in love with, considering what Manny Diaz did over the past two years. Um, I think it was a hire that made sense from the very beginning. So I, I think, you know, I like it. I'm not sure if I love it yet, but, you know, I'm willing to give it a shot for sure. Right. Um, and definitely a hire that uh, makes sense in our mind. Uh, over at Half Valley Insider, we had him on our initial hot board of candidates uh, that Penn State could target uh, with that, um, you know, 4 3 background. That's kind of that. That was a very important piece of this. James Franklin said that he would prefer not to change scheme if he didn't have to. So when you're staying with those four threes, um, that four three defensive philosophy really narrows down the field. On that, we mentioned names like Tom Allen, Jeff Collins, Joe Rossi, uh, and uh, Harris Simiak at Rutgers. Uh, we, we know Penn State obviously picked Tom Allen. Jeff Collins was a name that popped up. Uh, Joe Rossi, Penn State has shown interest in before. He's now at Michigan State. And Harris Simiak got a nice uh, new contract at Rutgers or a pay boost, um, which tells you there were teams interested. Uh, was Penn State? Who knows uh, for sure. But I have a pretty good feeling that Penn State definitely looked at three of the four guys and maybe all four. Uh, so another reason to definitely you know go over to Happy Valley Insider and subscribe. And you know, we know what we're talking about over there. We are connected into this program. Uh, so be sure to stay tuned over at Happy Valley Insider for more inside information. You get a free 30-day trial right now. Um, be sure to go over to PennState.Rivals.com and sign up there for more on the field, off the field, recruiting, everything in between intel that we can provide. Going back to Tom Allen, Marty, uh, I, I think what's really important here is 
He fits the culture, something that you talked about off camera. You can go a little bit here in depth again. But he also, I think, provides stability at the defense coordinator position for Penn State. He talked about how he didn't come to Penn State to elevate his name and became become a head coach again. He came to Penn State because he wanted to be the defense coordinator at Penn State because of the opportunity that was provided of being at that being that position, the defense coordinator, at a place like Penn State. Uh, it's a very unique opportunity, especially one taking over the top defense in the country. Um, just, I guess, speak a little bit to Tom Allen, how he fits his culture and what that stability could do for Penn State. Yeah, I, I know I mentioned this before we started recording. I think culturally, he's just such a great fit for Penn State. <clears throat> Excuse me, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me, I apologize. Getting over cold. No, you're but, good. Uh, you're good. No, as James Franklin will, will always says, you know, it always starts with I love you. It always ends with I love you. Right. And, and you look at Tom Allen at Indiana, the LEO, love each other. That, that, that mantra, that mindset, that program had, and you saw it. Those kids always played hard for Tom Allen. And that's part of what excites me about this hire. Would he be my first choice? No, but at the same time, he was definitely on my short list. I think this is a really good hire. Um, and again, it goes back to the culture fit. At Indiana, he was a guy who got buy-in from his players, who maximized the ability of those players. So now you put him at Penn State, where he's going to have much more talented players. Um, and I feel like you kind of saw this from him in his introductory press conference on Wednesday. You know, he was talking about being a linebacker you, and he was talking about Abdul Carter, and he was talking about Kobe King, and being able to have those kinds of players. And he mentioned how at Indiana, and I think some of this was kind of tooting his own horn, rightfully so, he would take guys like a Brian McFadden, who was a two-star recruit, a, a no-star recruit, and turn them into All-Americans, turn them into NFL players. So if he's doing that with that kind of a player, it's it's exciting to think what he could do with the with the caliber player he'll have on defense at Penn State. Um, yeah, Three like All-Americans at linebacker there in, uh, I believe, his eight years there. Uh, that, at Indiana, which, that's really impressive. But the, yeah, that's that's insane. And, and, you know, again, I just I think culturally he fits here really well. I think he's going to mesh really well with what James Franklin wants within his program. And, you know, we see p- people can say what they want about James Franklin as a game day coach, and sometimes – Though those those criticisms are warranted. But when it comes to being the leader of the program, the CEO of the program, the face of the program, there are a few coaches in the country who do that aspect of the job better than James Franklin. And right. I think Tom Allen fits into that as well. I think that's part of what makes Tom Allen such a great fit at Penn State. And, you know, you, you mentioned him not looking to, uh, to, to leave for any job, maybe providing some stability. You know, and again, you you can't put a lot of stock in this, right? No, but no. His press conference on Wednesday, he seemed genuinely excited to be at Penn State. He seemed right. genuinely excited to be calling a defense and coaching linebackers and have to worry about anything else. So right. we'll see what happens. I think this is a really strong hire. I think Tom Allen will do good things. Now, I will say he, he's he's coming in a tough position. Because this was, like you mentioned, Dylan, the best defense in the country this year by a lot of metrics. How do you improve the number one defense in the country? Manny Diaz was beloved here. Um, Manny ran just an aggressive attacking style of defense. It was so good. If he ever visits Penn State again, unless it's as an opposing head coach, he's never going to have to buy probably another beer in in, in State College again. I think he could come in here as opposing head coach and it wouldn't matter. Like I think people love Manny Diaz. Um, but I, I think Tom Allen has the ability to put himself in a similar position. So, yeah. Right. Like I said, he, he's a great culture fit. He's a really good defensive football mind, a really good defensive football coach. And I'm going to be curious, too, Indiana, you know, we, we saw him not afraid to leave corners on an island, not not afraid to trust his guys. So if he's willing to trust his guys with Indiana talent, I'm sure he's going to be willing to trust his guys with Penn State talent. And even that yeah. is exciting to think, hey, if I'm going to trust my corners and my safeties out there in coverage and go get the quarterback, what could that look like with the defense as talented as what Tom Allen's going to have next year and beyond? So, yeah, right. all in all, and, I think it's a really good hire. Right. I think Tom Allen would do really good things at Penn State. And, yeah, just, just an all-around good job by James Franklin. And, and, and to the administration as well, they get crapped on a lot. What was the report that Tom Allen was making? $1.5 million this year? Yeah, Penn 1.5. State's got two, 
two coordinators well north of a million dollars. That's that's the kind of thing you need in this era of college football. So even to that, kudos to everybody, tip of the cap to everybody to uh, to get Penn State on board in that fashion. And I'm I'm, I'm not 100 percent certain, but I believe on top of that, Andy Kultanicki also had a buyout in his contract at Kentucky, Kentucky at Kansas, uh, which I mean. You're talking about paying him 1.5 upward to $2 million by the end of that contract, plus whatever that buyout was, which I'm sure if it was there was, it, it wasn't, you know, a, a cheap like $100,000 buyout. I'm sure that was north of 500 at least. Um, so, I mean, they, they had to pony up money for him. And Tom Allen helps a little bit that he got $15 million from Indiana not to coach. But uh, at the end of the day, that's a guy, and it makes sense. I wasn't sure if he was going to jump back into coaching right away, but that's a football coach through and through. He was a high school football coach for a long time before he got into the college game. And he's going to be coaching until, uh, you know, until he's no longer on this earth, I feel. So uh, we'll see how long Tom Allen is at Penn State, but it's, it's definitely a good fit for the Nittany Lions. Rings very similar style defense as Manny Diaz and Brad Pry. He's going to be aggressive. He's all about causing turnovers and, and chaos as well. It's going to be harder to cause. It's going to be hard to cause more chaos than Manny Diaz did. But I don't think we're going to see a huge drop off in aggressiveness or anything from Tom Allen, to Tom Allen, or from Andy Diaz to Tom Allen. Um, and then, any final thoughts on Tom Allen as a hire for Penn State? Yeah, like I said, I like it. Um, I think it made sense. I think it's a cultural fit, like Marty said. Um, we'll see how it plays out on the field. I think it has a yeah. lot of potential. Yeah, it absolutely has a lot of potential. Like we said, I, and it's going to be hard to judge him, I think, off 2024. I mean, if they come out and post uh, top 10 numbers again, uh, good, That that's great. But if they see a small drop-off, I wonder how the fan base will react. But, it's, I mean, it's hard to, one, improve upon the number one defense in the country. And, two, this is a defense that's losing a ton of talent going forward, going, going forward into 2024. Um, so it's going to be interesting how you replace those pieces. But one last thing I'd say is uh, – uh, it this should only help Penn State's recruitment at a linebacker going forward because of what Marty said about what he was able to do at Indiana with that town. Uh, he's one of the best linebacker coaches in the country. I think he's going to have a great uh, do a great job at Penn State as well. But also, it gives Penn State another tie to the Midwest, which is always beneficial. But also, Tom Allen has been able to recruit Florida very well in his career, especially at Indiana. Having another guy who can recruit Florida. Uh, is big for this staff as well. How would we grade the Tom Allen hire, guys? I, I, I think personally, I have to give Tom Allen a hire probably an, an A. I mean, I don't think you could have gone wrong with any of those four names we mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, Tom Allen, I think, is a, is probably the second best hire they probably could have made after Howard Simeon. Uh, Anthony, what, what's, your, what's your grade on the hire? Um, I'd probably, I've been saying somewhere between a B plus and an A minus. Sure. Um, like I said, safe hire. I like it. I don't know if I love it yet. So I'm going to go with a B plus for now, but it's definitely, you know, he was on my top three list. So I, I, I think it's a solid hire for James. Marty, how would you grade out the, the hire here? Sorry about that. Yeah. Similar to Anthony, um, <clears throat> probably like a B plus thing, a solid hire. Not my top choice, but yeah, really, really good all around hire, and I think it'll do really good things here. All right, uh, and, and build off that, how would we grade James Franklin's job at hiring both an offense coordinator and defense coordinator this offseason in a matter of a couple of weeks uh, between each other? It's tough to replace, and ultimately, only time will tell how well both hires ultimately do, but you know. Uh, two two big hires here that are going to shape the future of Penn State football. How to grade this offseason? I, I think uh, for these two coordinators, at least, I think you have to go with an A. I mean, Andy Coltonicki was the best hire Penn State could have made at offensive coordinator. And then Tom Allen is a pretty good hire, as we just said. So I, I think A, a plus for, for James Franklin here. Yeah, I definitely give it an A. Uh, I think, yeah. you know, Coltonicki was a home run. I love that hire. That's an A plus plus hire to me. And you made a really good hire, a solid hire in Tom Allen. So, yeah, I'd, overall, I think James did a good job given the circumstances. I give it an A. 
Yeah, I give it an A as well. I I know I told you guys off air, but I remember I was sitting at the Pittsburgh Steelers against Green Bay Packers game when Mike Yurcich was fired, and the first thing I did was Google who is Kansas's offensive coordinator. Um, so yeah, I think Colton Nicky was a home run of a hire, maybe even a grand slam of a hire. I think Tom Allen is really solid hire. Yeah, definitely an A for the hires that James made this off season. All right, moving into a, a little bit of a house cleaning segment here. Just going to quickly go over who has announced that they will be uh, going to the NFL and who are still waiting uh, for word on their future, whether that's NFL, retiring, transfer portal, whatever it may be, just guys that we have targeted as potential guys to leave. So who we've heard from so far going to the NFL, de- defensive back Daquan Hardy, linebacker Curtis Jacobs, defensive end Chop Robinson, uh, offensive lineman Caden Wallace, tight end Theo Johnson, all f- all those guys have declared for the NFL. The only guy so far that has stated they will opt out of the Peach Bowl in a couple of days, well, what, nine days from now, 10 days from now, is Chop Robinson. Uh, everybody else right now plans on playing. I'm assuming a lot of them will be on snap counts for that game. Uh, but guys we're waiting on still offensive lineman Sal Warmly, defensive back Johnny Dixon, tight end Tyler Warren. Cornerback, Kalen King. Wide receiver, Keandre Lambert-Smith. Wide receiver, Dante Cephas. Defensive tackles, Hakeem Beeman and Devon Ellis. Defensive end, Adisa Isaac. Running back, Trey Potts. Um, Anthony Marty uh, should be back in a minute here. So so quickly, Anthony, looking at these guys that we still are waiting on. Sal Warmly, I feel like, likely returns to Penn State. I don't think his draft stock is off. It's, it's too high after the season. I think he played better than he has in the past. But I think coming back could definitely benefit him, and I think it benefits Penn State if he would come back. Yeah, I think that's the name I'm looking at, you know, as the guy on that list that's most yeah. likely. Well, obviously, there's you know, as you went further down the list, there's some guys that are likely to come back. Sure. But, you know, I think Wormley makes a lot of sense to come back. Um, I think, sure. you know, I don't think his draft stock is, is super high to the point that he would consider leaving like a Caden Wallace or even a Daquan Hardy. Obviously, when a guy is going into their sixth year, which is, you know, for now, with the COVID years that these guys still have, you know, it's still a little bit of an unprecedented situation for a lot of these staffs. We have, uh, what, is is this next year going to be the last co- guy, last group of COVID years, or do we have one more year of COVID years? I'm after not sure that? if it's the last one next year or the it's, year it's, after that, It's but, either the penultimate or the ultimate, but yeah, uh, almost done, thankfully. I'm, I'm looking forward to going back to five years. Yeah, um, Sam. I think I think everybody is. I think the staffs feel the same way there. But because um, these six years and even seven years are again ridiculous. Yeah, it would it would make sense for uh, Wormley to come back. I think he would benefit from an extra year, um, as opposed to guys like Caden Wallace and Daquan Hardy, where if you would love to get them back, if you could have, trust me, uh, I'm sure the staff right. really wanted to get them back. But they probably maxed out what their draft potential is. They both had really solid years, especially Daquan Hardy. He was spectacular this year. Um, I will continue to sit on the on the mountain of Daquan Hardy with the best corner on this team this year. But, yeah, we'll see. Uh, and then, uh, just to spit off that, uh, Johnny Dixon and J- Kalen King we haven't heard from, but uh, for those listening closely during Penn State's uh, National Sign Day uh, live stream on Wednesday, uh, Terry Smith, when talking to one of the cornerback recruits, talked about Penn State losing three corners to the NFL this year. Well, Daquan already has already declared for the NFL, and there's two other defensive backs that we're waiting to hear more about, which would make you believe that Kalen King, uh, not surprisingly, and Johnny Dixon, also not surprisingly, will be headed to the NFL draft. Both will be top three-round draft picks. King likely maybe late first after this season, but likely a second-round pick at this point. Um, Tyler Warren, I think Penn State would definitely benefit from having him back. I think he would benefit maybe from coming back as well, but – He's definitely somebody who will go to a combine test well if he does declare and be drafted high. KLS, we'll see what happens. I think Portal or maybe the NFL draft are likely there. Um, Dante Cephas probably should return to Penn State. KLS could also return to Penn State as well, obviously. Um, Akeem Beeman, Devon Ellis will be interesting to see what happens there. Both have six years of eligibility. Don't know if either one has terribly high NFL draft stock right now. Adisa Isaac, I think we all agree. We believe will end up going to the NFL trade pots. What happens there? Will I mean, the running back room is stacked going into the next year. He already had a limited role this year, even though he performed well. Um, 
his role likely next year? One scan would be limited. Does he decide to hang it up? Does he try to pursue the NFL? Maybe. Uh, I don't know if he can transfer again, um, but uh, we'll be some of the watch there as well. Going over to the portal, uh, Penn State does have one transfer portal commitment currently from kicker Chase Meyer. He will be a walk-on, was at uh, Tulsa. Really nice kicker for Tulsa. Didn't do – and didn't have any super long kicks. I think his longest kick was 45 yards, but was a consistent, reliable kicker for Tulsa. He'll come in and compete with Sander Sahedak for that uh, kicking job. As um, So that will be something to watch here. Um, they also had a commitment from offensive lineman Alan Heron, who committed and then within days – has now signed with Maryland. That was the only little bit of drama Penn State had this week. Uh, not a terribly big loss for Penn State. He was he, he had an upside, but he was not going to be a guy who immediately impacted them in any way next year, in my opinion. Maybe as a depth player, but that's about it. That turns our attention to the wide receiver in the transfer portal where Penn State is targeting a majority of guys right now. That's where our focus is for sure over at Half Valley Insider. Three names to know there. Andre Green out of North, the North Carolina transfer. Miami transfer Colby Young and Ohio State transfer Pennsylvania native as well, Julian Fleming. Uh, Andre Green had a really good visit to Penn State. He also took a visit to Virginia, had interest in, interest in Wisconsin. Right now, signs are leaning, pointing towards Virginia. Penn State had a really good visit there, like I said, but right now I'm definitely leaning towards him heading to Virginia. Colby Young, it seems like all the intel there is pointing towards Georgia. I know there's some... Uh, future cast, um, crystal balls, RPMs, whatever you want to call them, throughout the industry headed towards Georgia as well. And then the ultimate question, guys, where is Julian Fleming? If you ask Instagram right now, he's in Miami, um, not visiting the Hurricanes that we knew no, that we know if he didn't visit Miami, but uh, he is in Miami right now. It looks like enjoying his time off, but uh. It looks like this is going to be Nebraska or Penn State. We feel pretty good about him and ultimately ended up as a mini line. But when's he going to make an announcement? We we honestly have no clue. Uh, everybody, it feels like, is in the dark about Julian Fleming. Honestly, gentlemen, I'm not going to be surprised if we find out where Julian Fleming ultimately ends up when classes start at wherever school he ends up. I think that's may, that may, this is how this recruitment may very well end. Uh, any thoughts on those three guys? Julian Fleming or Julian Fleming? The, the, only, the only thing I'll add on Julian Fleming here, make it quick, is I, I think Julian Fleming is a really good player. I mean, you look what he did in 2022 with Ohio State. That would have made him wide receiver one at Penn State. Um, <clears throat> and, and he carries himself in a way. Go When he entered the transfer portal, go read what Ohio State fans had to say about him because it's yep. glowing. You know, I think he carries himself in a way – that the the Penn State wide receiver room as a whole would really benefit from. I think right. he's team captain kind of material. Um, I know there's some Penn State fans out there who Julian Fleming could catch the game winning touchdown in the national championship game for Penn State next year, and they will still hold it against him that he did not go to Penn State out of high school. Right. But I, I think Fleming's mentality, his mindset, his is just everything, his work ethic would would go a long long way for this wide receiver room. Sure. That alone should have Penn State fans excited because I'm with you. I think they're going to get Fleming. I think it's when, not if. Um, I think it's possible he just shows up on campus for class here in two weeks or so. But um, yeah, you know, I, I think Penn State is going to really benefit from having Julian Fleming around. And is this a marriage that should have happened four years ago? Probably. But at the same time, I, I still think he can come here have a really, really, really strong final season while also changing the entire culture, mindset, whatever term you want to use for that wide receiver room. Yeah, and you look at Fleming. The, I think the story of Fleming at Ohio State is he still posted really good numbers. I mean, just short of a 1,000 career yards, I think, in his, what, three, four seasons there. Um, really good blocker on the outside, which is going to help Penn State's run game a ton as well. But if he does end up at Penn State. Um, and – but I think he's somebody who come in immediately change the culture and the course of that wide receiver room. Because if Penn State suddenly has a true number one wide receiver, 
that's just going to create more opportunities for the rest of that room. Maybe they bring in another transfer, whether it's this uh, transporter window window or next transporter window. Um, uh, but it's going to create more opportunities there. You, you got a quarterback who can get him the ball. Um, and when he was on the field at Ohio State, he performed rather well. The, the, the unfortunate part for him is, did he live up to the hype at Ohio State that was set upon him coming out of high school? Probably not. I mean, he, he didn't end up being the number one wide receiver at Ohio State. He didn't end up being a top wide receiver in the country. He had a really good career, though. He was a really damn good player for Ohio State. Unfortunately for him, the wide receivers in front of him were potentially the three best wide receivers in college football each of their three, each of their last years at Ohio State. Marvin Harrison Jr. is maybe the best wide receiver we've seen coming out of college football since I, – I don't even know. I mean – he, he's one of the best wide receivers in the last 20 years to come out of college. Jackson Smith and Jigba went on the field, was elite. Chris Olave was amazing. I mean, the list goes on. He had so many dudes in front of him at Ohio State that he barely had the time, the chance to get on the field and show that he what he could do. At, if he comes to Penn State or he goes to Nebraska, wherever he ends up, he's going to have the opportunity to be that dude. And I think he's going to take advantage of that. I mean, I'm not going to say he's going to go out and get a thousand yards next season, but I think we're talking about a guy who who could very well come close to posting what he posted in his career at Ohio State next year for whatever offense he's a part of. Anthony, any thoughts on Julian Fleming or these other guys? I mean, if you're talking about these other guys, Andre Green, if he ends up in Virginia, tough, tough one to buy for Penn State, uh, but I didn't see him as an immediate impact guy next year. What if? Probably had a role, but I saw him more of a Malik McLean type role potentially um, as a comparison. Colby Young, though, was a guy who I think could have came to Penn State, been a really good number two or even number one wide receiver, depending on how things played out. But any thoughts on these wide receivers or, or Julian Fleming specifically? Yeah, to me, Green was more of a long-term play. I'm guessing right. Virginia was able to sell him more on coming in and playing right away as opposed to Penn State where he'd be more of what they already have in the room, if not, you know, a reserve guy. So, sure. you know, best of luck to him. Hope it works out. Uh, Colby Young, I agree. I don't get – I understand Georgia is a, natty, a national championship, you know, contender every single year. But, man, their room is stacked. I don't get that decision from him if he goes to Georgia. I think he's got one year left of eligibility on top of that. You don't want to be also, fighting for a spot in the two deep. Like, also, go where Georgia you're just play. doesn't throw the ball much. Yeah, like personally for me, he'd be better off going going back to Miami or waiting till January and visiting somewhere else if he didn't want to go to Penn State. But I just don't think that makes a lot of sense for him. But I wish him best of luck. Um, Fleming, I like I think Marty said it really well. I still think he's a good player as long as he can stay healthy. He'll absolutely be a starter, probably our number one as things currently stand right now. I will see what happens in January if more guys pop in. And um, yeah, obviously I know the fan base is chomping at the bit to hear some news on him, but he seems like he's just kind of on his own timeline and he's currently partying in Miami. So I, I, respect that. I, I, mean, I, I would be partying in Miami too. So I hope he's enjoying himself. But yeah, he's um, got nothing to do right now. To answer your question from before though, Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best player to come out of uh, college, best receiver to come out of college football since Calvin Johnson. That was the name you're thinking of. Yeah, that's, that's, you're honestly probably right with that. Um, and obviously, there's been a lot of good guys to come out of college as wide receivers, but uh, he's by far the most complete wide receiver probably since, yeah, Megatron. And he may go as – what, Megatron went number two? Number two. Yeah, he's, he's, let's not forget who went number one. <laughs> it, it's going to be hard for him to, uh, you know, maybe go – he's not going to probably go number one. Maybe he goes number two, but uh, he's going to have a, be in a top five draft pick. And um, I, I saw people – and we'll, we'll go off, but I, I saw people complaining during the season about – it would be insane to say that Marvin Harrison Jr. would be a number one wide receiver on like half NFL teams this year. But I absolutely believe if he was playing in the NFL this year, he would have been a number one wide receiver for maybe all but like 10 teams. He's that good. So, I mean, Julian Fleming, yeah, didn't have the career maybe that some expected out of Ohio State, but it wasn't all his own fault. Was he inconsistent at times? Yes. Did he have some issues staying healthy at times? Yes. But that he was still a damn good player. He's going to go somewhere for one year, and then he's going to go probably the NFL as a, a a day two draft pick at the latest. All right. Well, you know, I, I think we talked we talked those first three segments within thirty minutes. I think that's a pretty 
big success for us on this podcast. We like to talk things a bit long. Um, I will say last thing with the transfer portal, those are really only the guys we really are talking about right now because there's really not much going on right now for Penn State. They did host some other guys. Some of those have decided to go elsewhere. Now, worth noting, it is a dead period for everybody until January 3rd. Then the dead period ends for four-year and two-year transfers. From January 3rd to January 7th or 8th, they're able to take official visits or visits again. For Penn State, the registration deadline for classes for the spring semester is January 7th. So Penn State theoretically will have a four-day window from January 3rd through the 7th to get guys on campus um, and potentially get them to commit. Now, that's going to be a very fast timeline. You're going to have to get guys on campus and convince them to come to campus within a day or two of visiting. So we're going to be looking at a fast timeline if they do, in fact, get anybody on campus in that small four-day window. I know last year they did have a couple guys or a guy or two on campus that window right after the um, the Rose Bowl. So this will be happening right after the Peach Bowl. Uh, so that will be something to watch. We should gain clarification on if anything is happening within that time period over uh, in the next week or so. So be stay tuned at Have Valley Insider, um, PennStateRivals.com for the latest on that information. With that, gentlemen, let's move on to the big portion of today's class, the 2024 recruiting class for Penn State. Um, to begin, I guess just kind of let's get our quick overall thoughts about this class for Penn State. Um, over at Rivals.com, 25 commitments, top 15 recruiting class in the country. I don't see that changing too much in terms of total ranking. It's going to end up probably between 15, 16, 17, maybe 18, depending on how the classes behind them you know, play out. But overall, I think this is a really good class for Penn State, one that's probably underrated by across the industry quite a bit. Um, Maybe not a headliner class per se as compared to some of the past ones, but this is a really good complementary class for Penn State. They get some nice depth at the skill positions, but where they really went strong in this one, I believe, is in the trenches, and I think that's where it's most, most important. They really, really got strong in the trenches in this uh, recruiting class. They added good size in this recruiting class in the trenches on both sides of the ball. I think that's important for Penn State. Marty, what's your overall thoughts here quickly just on uh, the, the recruiting class as a whole? Yeah, I think it's a really good class. You know, we talked about this for in the air, but I think this is the best, uh, like, three consecutive classes that James Franklin has stacked at Penn State. Um, I know Anthony and I went back and forth this a little bit. I, I would argue <clears throat> that this is in the conversation for the third best class. James Franklin has signed behind 2018 and behind that really strong 2022 class. But if you look at it in 22, in the 23, not in the 24, because, you know, 22, 23, and 24 are three of the four best classes he signed in 2018. So he, he's stacking yeah. these classes. These are three straight really strong classes. This class goes really strong in the trenches. I think this is both. I think this is the best defensive line class he signed. I think it can be the best offensive line class he signed if these guys hit. Um, you, you've got a really damn good quarterback. Yeah, this is a really, really, really strong class for Penn State. Yeah, Anthony, what's your thoughts? I mean, he talked about the defensive line class. and I mean, Deion Barnes is arguably, could arguably be the recruiter of the year for Penn State. Uh, Phil Trailline obviously deserves some uh, run in that conversation as well. Um, but, yeah, I agree with what Marty said. Anthony, what are your general thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a solid class all around. There's only like two position groups that I'm kind of like meh on. We'll see. And that's the, to me, that's wide receiver and linebacker. But and even then, I still think there's guys in those groups that could be players. It just, you know, depends on what happens. But every other group, I, I really like the makeup of this class. I think there's a lot of potential superstars in this class, a lot of guys that might not start out playing right away, but guys that have seriously high potential down the road. And I think there's some guys who are going to have some first year impact as well. So is it, I do I, I don't think it's better than the 22 or the 23 classes, but I don't think it's far behind the 23 class at all. And I think it's going to be a really solid class when we look back on it in a few years. 
Agreed, agreed. All right. We're going to go through every player here. Not not in depth on every player, but we're going to mention at least every player. Talk quickly mention a couple of things about each at least. Go a little bit more in depth on a few. And we will start. We'll go through this alphabetically, so it's not my position group. And then we're just going alphabetically. Easiest way to do it. All right. We start at the top. Liam Andrews, six foot four, two hundred and sixty pound defensive lineman out of uh, Massachusetts. Dexter Southfield picked Penn State over South Carolina and Wisconsin. A guy that Penn State started recruiting as an offensive lineman actually, until he decided about midway through this year that he wanted to be a defensive lineman at the next level. Penn State liked him enough as a defensive lineman. They really loved his potential as an offensive lineman as well. Um, but he's coming in as a defensive lineman. Uh, just, uh, I mean, really sky-high potential here. Really strong kid, physical kid, great athlete. Um, Marty, I know this, this is somebody you really, really like in this cycle. What is what are your thoughts on uh, Liam Andrews, who I think could be a, a, a game-changer on that defensive line in the future? Yeah, I think Andrews can be that elite defensive tackle they've been lacking in recent years. I, I think he's a really good player, really explosive, extremely violent, uses his hands very well, relentless motor. Yeah, just just a great recruiting win. You know, on Happy Valley Insider, <clears throat> excuse me, in our in our sign day recap, I called this the best win of the cycle for Penn State. Yeah. Because after looking like the early leaders, they kind of fell behind. Look like Andrews may have been an afterthought, and they rallied to win this recruitment. Great recruiting victory by the staff. I think Andrews can be an elite defensive tackle for Penn State. And I, just, as we go through, I'm, I may provide some interesting facts here and there, whatever I may find in their bios provided by Penn State. And then Penn State communications staff or uh, football communications department put really together a really nice bio. But everything in one spot for us uh, really helps us here. Um, but really nothing that really stands out here. Um, but one of the more uh, interesting, fun middle names, I guess you could say here, uh, middle name is Finn, Liam Finn Andrews, but a really good prospect all around, all around was a consensus four-star prospect throughout the entire industry. Um, Anthony, I was supposed to give you Liam Andrews to talk about. Uh, so how about you now talk about Liam Andrews? We're not going to, both of you are not going to talk about each player individually like this, but, Liam Andrews is one of the top guys in this class. So what, what's your thoughts on Liam Andrews? Yeah, I can go into his recruitment a little bit since that's yeah, kind of what call him more than anything else. So um, Andrews, it came down to Penn State and South Carolina from what I remember. It was a very, very quiet recruitment. He kind of just took his visits and was very methodical about it. Didn't leak a lot out to the media, which kind of drove the fan base nuts because usually like we kind of have an idea or somebody has an idea of what's going on. Wasn't necessarily the case with Liam Andrews until like the very end where it started to leak that Penn State was the team out in front, but it was pretty close and Penn State was able to pull it out at the end. So, you know, obviously a great pickup, um, a fundamental piece of that defensive line class, especially at a, a position of need for Penn State moving forward in defensive tackle. I think he's definitely a guy that can uh, play in year one. I don't think he's going to be pushing for starting time, but I think he can be in the rotation, and especially since he'll be enrolling early. He'll have an opportunity to get ahead of the game. Yeah, well said. And, uh, yeah, actually, let me bring up our uh, tracker from um, signing day. And I, I will go through who is enrolling early as we talk about it. Um, should have had that pulled up before. My apologies here. Um, Liam Andrews, by the way, here at Rivals, we had him rated as a four-star prospect, uh, number two player in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and he has, like you said, he will be enrolling early. Moving on here from Liam Andrews, we will go next up to. Okay, wasn't muted. Make sure I wasn't muted. Uh, defensive back Antoine Belgrave, shorter. Somebody that I know Marty is very high on. Somebody I think across the industry is probably a little bit, you know, undervalued. Um, but three. <coughs> Apologize. Um, quality three star prospect. Top 60 corner in the country. Marty, uh, go a little bit here uh, and talk about what you like about ABS so much. Yeah, I like Bill Griff short a lot, not just here rivals. I think across the board, all the industries are too low on him. I think he can step in and play right away in the fall. I think he's got the, the build for it physically. I think he's got the athleticism for it. He's a physical corner. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think Antoine, Antoine Belgrave Shorter is going to have a very good career for Penn State, and I can see it starting in the fall. Like I said, in my opinion, the most underrated guy in this class, and in no world should he not be a four-star recruit. I, I think Belgrave Shorter does some really good things for Penn State starting this fall. And, you know, we're we're actually, I'm going to call a little bit of an audible here um, with the cornerback, with ABS. What, let's talk about his teammate quickly as well, Jonathan Mitchell, another guy who's probably a little bit underrated. By the way, ABS will be enrolling early, as will, I believe, Jonathan Mitchell will be enrolling early here. Uh, let me double check. Um, yes, they'll both be enrolling early. But uh, Jonathan Mitchell, any thoughts on Jonathan Mit- Mitchell as well, who we have as a three-star recruit as well here? Yeah, I think that's, you know, Mitchell is definitely a little underrated as well. Very talented player. Um, getting those two together to me is is a phenomenal pickup. You know, I think ABS is underrated across all platforms. I think he's just a really good player in, in press coverage. I think John Mitchell is a little bit of a better athlete than ABS. But they're going to complement each other well. They're both going to have an opportunity to come in and play early because, you know, we're we're losing Hardy to the NFL. We know that. Most likely Dixon and King as well, if you're reading between the lines. So, you know, there's going to be an opportunity there. And and those guys will will be able to come in early and and try to take that. And I think they're talented enough to see the field in year one. I really do. Yeah, two guys there. You're talking about multi-year potential starters for uh, Penn State, which uh, you, you can always take it. If they can make an impact in year one, uh, that's all. I mean, we saw this year uh, in the secondary, multiple freshmen make uh, first-year mm-hmm. impact. Antoine Belgrave Shorter, as a senior, recorded tw- 72 tackles, four interceptions, including one return for a touchdown, had eight pass breakups, a fumble recovery, and one reception for 38 yards. He also had three interceptions as a junior. We're talking about a really productive uh, prospect here for Penn State who's going to step in. A guy who played a lot of high school football as well, um, play, playing three years of varsity down there in Florida and Mandarin yeah. High School. One more thing, too, to add on them before we go to the next yeah. guy. No, you know, when, you're, when you're dealing with Florida guys, you never know what's going to happen with their recruitments. I was, we saw last year with Conrad Hussey, you know, Penn State had him for months up until signing day, and he flipped to Florida State. Mitchell and Belgrave Shorter, there was absolutely no drama with those two. And they're very talented players that I'm sure the local schools were, were trying to gauge interest in, and as well as other schools across the country. And, and there was just no drama, nothing to really report. They were just steady to Penn State, signed with no issue. It was pretty cool to see. That doesn't happen very often where there's just no drama with Florida guests. I mentioned this in my nitbits on Thursday, but I mean in whole, it was a drama-free recruiting class for Penn State. One D commitment in the entire class that was from offensive lineman Derek Plaz. In June, who well, I'll be honest, I forgot that Derek Plaz was committed to it till I looked it up today to see how many D commitments there was. It was just Derek Plaz who was committed for a month, maybe in in from between May and June. D committed and out Miami. Um, yeah, drama free for Penn State. Uh, we're not going to complain about it. That's for sure. Here we already have full schedules without the drama. With the drama, we, we we're good with no drama. Um, Moving on from the two cornerbacks, uh, offensive lineman Egan Boyer is next up. Um, you know, th- this is a really intriguing offensive lineman for Penn State. Six foot eight, picked Penn State over programs like Auburn, uh, Clemson, and Virginia Tech. So he did have quite a bit of quality in other pro- quality programs interested in him. Rated as the fit- number 15 prospect here on Rivals. Three star recruit. Um, Smart kid, wants to be a mechanical engineer, actually wants to pursue a career in NASCAR as, as an engineer. That's not something you always see in, in, in these bios, but uh, it will be interesting to see if he does, uh, you know, maybe maybe he has a, a detour to uh, the NFL before then, but Penn State does have, um, you know, connections now in NASCAR. Journey Brown is a pit, a pit, a pit guy for uh, one uh, – I forget which which uh, racing company, but he's in NASCAR right now for Journey Brown, doing a great job over there. Um, moving off, Egan Boyer, you got Caleb Brewer, another off a guy who we had listed as an athlete. It was unclear what Penn State was going to bring him in as a defensive line, offensive line, tight end. He could play all three. 
They officially listed him as an offensive lineman. He picked Penn State over Notre Dame and Michigan. <laughs> Six foot four, 270 pounds, big kid, really good athlete. We'll see what ha happens here. He's a gym rat. I mean, he, he lists one of his hobbies as working out. He is a gym rat. Um, really, really smart kid, teammate of 2023 signee Javen Williams. So we'll see what happens with Gail Brewer, but does have some potential here for Penn State. We'll be, again, he's an intriguing prospect, has college football pedigree. His grandfather, Tim Brewer, played football at Army. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the wide receivers here as a whole, um, and that will be Josiah Brown out of uh, New York, Peter Gonzalez out of uh, Pittsburgh Central Catholic, and Tizier Denmark out of uh, Imhotep Charter. Denmark, a four-star recruit. They are three were three-star recruits on Rivals. Um, and I should mention, going back to Egan Boyer and Cooper Cousins, I, I forgot to mention their uh, enrollment status. Cooper Cousins, no, sorry, we talked, we didn't get to Cooper Cousins yet. We will in a second. Um, Caleb Brewer will be a summer enrollee. He's staying in high school to finish out his high school wrestling career. Egan Boyer will be enrolling early. He'll be in campus in January. Going to the wide receivers, Tizier Denmark will be a summer enrollee. Peter Gonzalez will be a summer enrollee. Josiah Brown will be enrolling early. However, Josiah Brown did tear his ACL, uh, I believe, multiple ligaments in his knee halfway through his junior season. So he uh, he will be rehabbing that. Uh, gentlemen, the the wide receivers, just, what's our overall thoughts on this wide receiver class? I think it's a high potential class. Dizier Denmark has a high ceiling. Peter Gonzalez has a high ceiling. Josiah Brown, a speedster. But none of them are going to probably be immediate, true, true immediate impact guys. Dizier Denmark maybe can be that guy. But Peter Gonzalez, I think, probably needs a year. Desire Brown coming off that knee injury isn't going to play next season probably. Um, what's our overall thoughts here? Sorry, that uh, took me a second. Um, I think this is going to sound like a really bad indictment on the wide receiver room that they brought in, but I think your best wide receivers in this class are currently your running backs. Um, I, you know, I, I think those guys have potential, but like you said, I think that they're going to be guys more for down the road as opposed to right now. You know, I think you know, Gonzalez is probably one of my favorite guys in this class. I think he's got a high ceiling if he can hit it. I think he's tall. He's around 6'3". He's a good athlete for his for his height, and he's got good speed. But I think he's a guy, potentially, for the future. And I think Brown and Denmark could both have an impact as well. But I'm, I'm personally really excited to see what uh, they could do if, with Quentin Martin and maybe a guy like Corey Smith as well. If you can move them around a little bit. I, I think that the potential is there for them to be really good wide receivers, too. So, Marty? Yeah, I like Peter Gonzalez a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me, wide receiver. I think Gonzalez is going to be a uh, probably multi-year starter here on campus. I do a lot of good things. I think Josiah Brown. You know, it, the the big thing with Josiah Brown is going to be that knee injury he suffered this year. If he can recover from that and being an explosive playmaker, still has a great get. Um, but I, I I'm with Anthony. You know, I I really like Corey Smith in the slot. I I really like Quentin Martin as your all around gadget dude, all kind of guy. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. Looking wide receiver in this class, I think those two may have the highest ceiling, but I still think Pierre Gonzalez can be a really good player. And you know, if Ty Sear Denmark puts it all together, he's going to be a damn good receiver at Penn State. It's just it, it's far from a given that Denmark is going to put it all together on the field. Yeah, that's a great point. A little bit about them. Um... Josiah Brown, like I said, tore his knee, unfortunately, so it's going to be a little bit till we see him. Three-star recruit, um, uh, I think, across the industry, um, uh, but especially here on Rivals, we have his three-star recruit. Uh, he was an all-Catholic League selection three times in New York, all Nassau South County three, uh, selection in 2023. As a senior, uh, and all-state honors in 2023. Uh, as a senior, 589 all-purpose yards and eight touchdowns, had 23 receptions, 452 yards and eight touchdowns as a junior as well. Also played as a sophomore uh, for a Malvern. Um, going to Peter Gonzalez. Peter Gonzalez, uh, 
Pittsburgh Central Catholic career leader in receiving yards, Pittsburgh Central Catholic season receiving yards record holder, season receiving touchdowns. Uh, as a senior, posted 47 receptions for 1,081 yards and 12 touchdowns. Both of those are season single single season records. He had 2,200 yards in his career. If you're holding records at Pittsburgh Central Catholic, that says a lot about the type of talent you are. Comes from NFL bloodlines. His father, Pete, played at Pittsburgh uh, from 1993 to 1997. And then uh, also played in the NFL with the Steelers, Colts, and Bills. Also, his grandfather played at Pitt. So Penn State stops the Pitt ball line there uh, to land Peter Gonzalez. Dizer Denmark uh, ended his career at Imhotep Charter, started at Roman Catholic, but was a productive wide receiver throughout his career. Had some ups and downs, uh, but ultimately, you know, this was a kid once committed to Oregon, had offers from Ohio State and others, but ultimately it landed with Penn State. Um, you guys talked very well about those three right there. So I think we can move on. Off those guys, and we'll go then to DeAndre Cook, defensive lineman, 6'4", 270. Probably ends up as a – I think he probably starts as a defensive tackle. Would you guys agree? Yep. Probably starts as a defensive tackle at Penn State. Pick Penn State over Alabama, Boston College, North Carolina, Rutgers, and USC. Uh, as a senior, recorded 11, uh, 11 tackles for a loss, 10 sacks. As a junior, 20 tackles and 9 sacks. Consensus, consensus three-star prospect. Adam as number uh, five prospect in D.C. here on Rivals. Grandfather Lord, Lonnie Perrin played in the NFL uh, for the Denver Broncos, Chicago, Be- Chicago Bears, and Washington Redskins. And then um, he actually also uh, – sorry, that was somebody else we'll get to. Xavier Gilliam had other uh, interesting bloodlines in his uh, career. Um Big time bowler, by the way, DeAndre Cook. Um, I wonder if he's rolled if he's bowled a three hundred. Um, now, Penn State's biggest offensive line recruitment, I think we all can agree, is Cooper Cousins, in-state product from McDowell up in Erie. Guys, this is a guy who fits the mold of an ideal player. If you would ask James Franklin for Penn State, class leader, he's going to be a future captain for Penn State. Maybe a mo- I, I think he's a guy who could be a captain as a sophomore for Penn State. Um, ability to play any of the offensive line positions. Um, I think he could be in the rotation as early as this year for Penn State. Uh, maybe a center could play guard. Six foot six, three hundred twenty pounds. Um, this is a really big pickup for Penn State. He may be the he may be the guy who has the best career of any guy signed in this class as well for Penn State. Multi year starter. This guy this guy has the potential to be a all Big Ten, all American top offensive lineman. Uh, future NFL offensive lineman as well. Um, Marty, thoughts on Cooper Cousins? Yeah, I've said before, Cooper Cousins gives off a lot of Connor McGovern vibes to me and a guy who could play right away as a freshman if he needs to. Um, I don't know if he'll need to, though, which is, you know, a good sign for Penn State in their offensive line as a whole. But, uh, yeah, I think Cooper Cousins is going to have just an absolutely awesome career at Penn State. He's big, he's strong, he's physical, he's violent. Everything you want in offensive lineman, I think Cousins will go on to be a uh, potentially all timer on the offensive line for Penn State. Anthony, anything to add on Cooper Cousins? A big, big pickup for Penn State. This is a guy, first guy in this class committed almost two years ago. Um, picked Penn State at the time over uh, Kentucky and Pittsburgh. Um, that was it was a big recruiting win at the time, but he has really proven to be one of the best offensive linemen in this country. And like I said, this is a guy who I think could be a future captain as soon as maybe his sophomore year. Yeah, I think it's easy to forget that he's been committed for over two years, or almost two years at Penn State, because you would think that he should have been in the program like a year ago at this point. He's, he's kind of a forgotten man, but it's not because he's not really, really good, because he is. It's just been such a constant and such a consistent thing that he is going to be a part of this program. Like you said, it was over Pitt and Kentucky. I don't even think it was over anybody. Yeah, yeah James Franklin. James Franklin joked that he's been committed to Penn at the signing day show. That he's been committed to Penn State since the sixth grade. So this was a kid that grew up wanting to go to Penn State. Um, ended up being really, really freaking good that he could have played anywhere in the country and still didn't even bother with the recruiting process and wants to go to Penn State. So 
you know, yeah. you love that from the start, but also, like you said, I think he's going to be a guy that couldn't contribute year one, probably doesn't need to. By year two, he's probably starting somewhere because he's really good. Um, yeah, and he may be able to answer that center question for Penn State very quickly, too. Um, and I think uh, just ideal player, but ideal fit culture-wise. This is a kid who's very active in his community, helps with the Challenger Baseball League, elementary school reading nights, his uh, his school's autism walk. Guy, he was, he's a guy who's very involved in the community. Uh, this is going to be somebody that I think we see out and about in the Penn State community, always helping with charity events and all that type of thing. So he, he's going to be, I think, somebody who becomes very quickly beloved by the Penn State fan base. And, uh, like I said, Mark said, could be a future Penn State legend, for and just not for his on the field, uh, but – very bright future for Cooper Cousins. Um, moving off uh, Cooper Cousins, let's move on to our next pro, uh, prospect, defensive lineman T.A. Cunningham. Really an unknown. He's only, I don't think he's played football in the last two years uh, officially. Last stats we have for him was his sophomore year at Johns Creek in Georgia. 66 tackles, 22 tackles for a loss, seven sacks. Two forced fumbles, nine pass breakups. But despite not playing for two years, still a consensus four-star prospect. That's just all you have to know. The talent is off the charts. The potential is off the charts. I'm not sure if there's a player in this recruiting class who has more potential than T.A. Cunningham. I'll be honest. Um, but, I, but he hasn't played football in two years. I think coming to Penn State, finds his stability. Could be really good for him. Uh, but a big challenge for... Uh, for um, Deion Barnes here to see if he can get the most out of T.A. Cunningham. Either of you have thoughts on T.A. Cunningham? Yeah, to me, this is to Cunningham is the definition of a boomer bust prospect. Sure. He's like six foot six, a legitimate six foot six, 275 pounds right now. He'll carry like 320 pounds with absolute ease once he gets into the strength and conditioning program. He's got the frame that, you know, college defensive line coaches dream of. Like that's, he's got the makeup to become a game record defensive tackle. But like you said, he's a complete question mark and a complete unknown. We've said this before, if you're going to take a chance on somebody like that doesn't have the proven production, you, you take a chance on measurables, especially on the lines, because it's just so hard to find those elite guys. And that's what Penn State's going to do here. Um, yeah, it has the potential to be great. It also has the potential to not work out at all. So it, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I think you put that great. But, and also, very, very small side note, but by getting T.A. Cunningham, Penn State's automatically putting themselves, and if everything goes well with T.A. Cunningham, Penn State's automatically putting themselves in the conversation to be in his younger brother T.K. Cunningham's recruitment down the road. Uh, already is. And T.K. has just as much potential, maybe even more than his brother. Uh, I mean, let me double check here, but I think TK right now is one of the top. Uh, I mean, he's 2027, 20, but class 2027. 20, but he's going to be a high four star prospect, maybe even higher in that 2027 20, class. Already has nearly 20 scholarship offers, including LSU, Michigan, Penn State, USC. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely a name to know in 2027. 20, um, and I, just something to tuck in the back of your head for the next three years. Um, Marty, any thoughts before we move on? All right, moving on to our next kid, uh, prospect, I should say, uh, defense lineman Xavier Gilliam out of Quincy Orchard, Maryland. Um, six foot two, 280 pounds, will be a defensive tackle for Penn State, pick Penn State over Duke, North Carolina State, and Virginia Tech. As a senior, 42 tackles, 15 tackles for a loss, six sacks. At 52 tackles, 12 and a half tackles for a loss, six sacks, four forced fumbles. As a junior, um, Quincy Orchard, a program that Penn State's had great success recruiting over the last few years in this cycle. But also, I believe, um, if I'm correct, that is the high school of Chop Robinson. So, obviously, they got Chop Robinson out of the transfer portal, but uh, still have that tie. Um, Productive high school career. Wasn't the most highly recruited guy, but the production was there. And I think that's the most important part. Um, but pedigree, he has a lot of pedigree here. Has two brothers, um, 
his, sorry, his father played football at Morgan State. His uncle played football at McDaniel College. His cousin is a defensive lineman at Oklahoma. And then his great uncle played baseball for the Philadelphia Stars and the Homestead Grays. Um, that That is a cool little history uh, fact, a little right there. Um, and he's somebody who wants to get into the coaching world when he's after he's done. Um, we already talked about Peter Gonzalez, um, which takes us to uh, maybe the most important recruit of this cycle as we hit the one hour mark. And that is quarterback Ethan Grunk Meyer out of Lewis Center, Olentangy High School in Ohio. Uh, picked Penn State at the time over Cincinnati and Minnesota, which is weird to say, seeing that he's turned himself into a legitimate four star recruit, one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. First team all state, first team all conference, co conference all player, conference all player of the year in Ohio. Uh, holds Owen Tangi high school records for career passing yards with over 8,400 career touchdowns, pass touchdowns with 80, uh, season passing yards with over 3,517, 3, season passing yards with 39. As a senior, completed 66% of his passes for 3,517 yards and 39 touchdowns. Gentlemen, sorry to you, Marty. Thoughts on Ethan Grunkmeyer, who will be on campus early, and I forgot to mention with T.A. Cunningham and uh, Gilliam. Um, T.A. Cunningham will be on campus early, and so will Xavier Gilliam. Yeah, uh, I, I think Grunkmeyer, I, I think he's a guy who rivals we have a little underrated. Right, sure. I think he's a legitimate, you know, top 100 to 150 kind of kid. Um, I think next to Drew Alar, probably the most talented quarterback, the the best toolsy, just all around ability quarterback that Penn State is signing or James Franklin. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think he's the guy that's going to take over for Alar one day. Yeah, I, I am extremely high on the Grunkemeyer and his. His ability to do what he did on the camp circuit over the summer and to what he did as a senior this fall is a big reason for that. But yeah, I think Grunkemeyer is a tremendous quarterback, and I think this is going to prove to be a great just early early in the cycle identification kind of thing by Penn State leading to a really good recruiting victory. I mean, yeah, for all the faults that Mike Giersich had as an offensive coordinator, Nobody could ever fault that man for not being able to identify talent. I mean, he identified Drew really early before most schools did. Drew turns into one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. He identified Ethan Grunkmeyer before most schools did. I, I mean, you got to give credit to Cincinnati and Minnesota uh, as well. But Grunkmeyer, when he – we, well, you go back a year today, nobody, nobody knows who Ethan Grunkmeyer is. I mean, he's a guy who popped up on campus a few times, but if, if we thought that he was going to be Penn State's quarterback at this moment in time, we probably would have called a lot of people crazy. I mean, at this point last year, we were probably, what, saying Michael Van Buren was the likely quarterback for Penn State? Mm -hmm. And now Grunkmeyer is a better prospect than Michael Van Buren, um, in, my, in my opinion. I know um, in the eyes of uh, now former rivals guy, uh, Clint Cosgrove, he, he, when we were talking, uh, he, he thought Grunkmeyer was the better prospect out of the two. Um, and I know quite a lot of people would think that. Um, Grunkmeyer is a terrific talent. And Anthony, I'll, let, I'll go to you here on this. If all goes well, Grunkmeyer is probably the next man up at that quarterback position. And that's no disrespect to Bo Pabilo. That's no disrespect to Jackson Smollett, both very good quarterbacks. But Ethan Grunkmeyer has that skill set, has that arm strength, um, that football IQ, he, the steps he has shown from his junior season to his senior season, he showed a lot of that in the spring and in the offseason. And, and it's one thing to do it in the spring and the offseason, but then he went out on the field this season and against really good town Ohio was really impressive. Um, and that's what I, I think sold a lot of people on him. Uh, just what's your thoughts on Ethan Grothmeyer, the recruitment, the player, what Penn State's getting here? He very well could be the next man up for Penn State. Yeah, I was going to say, because sometimes I hate that we share the same brain, because I was literally going to start with your whole thing about Mike Yersic. That was literally the first thing I was going to say about Grant Kamire. Um Just an incredible talent evaluation there. This, this is why you were the best man in my wedding. 
Obviously, Yersic uh, couldn't call plays to save his life, but boy, could that man uh, scout quarterbacks. He hit on Drew first, and then Gronkemeyer. Both well, uh, obviously turned out to be incredible prospects. Um, yeah, I, once with Gronkemeyer, once I knew that because Clemson was sniffing, and there was talk that he was going to try to visit Clemson potentially and get an offer. Penn State was able to shut that down and get him to commit before he went to Clemson, and I think that was probably the uh, best decision or the best thing that Penn State was able to do with this cycle because obviously he just blossomed from there, became a, a star quarterback prospect, and is now, a, you know, I, I agree with Marty that he's a top 100 to top 150 guy, probably the second best quarterback that um, quarterback prospect that James Franklin has signed in the James Franklin era. And I, I do agree with you that if all goes right and he um, develops as he should, yeah, I, I think Bo Perbula has potential. I think Jackson Smolik has potential. But Ethan Gronkemeyer's potential could be even higher than those two. And, you know, he could surpass them pretty quickly. But, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm not going to write off those two just yet. They've both done good right. things. Well. But based off potential, it, it, it wouldn't be shocking. And, and they And they kind of... He was asked about that on on Wednesday, and he said, you know, having Drew there as a guy in front of him is going to be really beneficial. Ethan's coming in early, too, so he's going to head start. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something D – did Jackson Smolk enroll early last year? Yes, I, think, I believe he did. Yes. Yeah, um, Jackson Smolk got enrolled early. But um, – and no offense to Jackson Smolk, but Ethan Grunkmeyer is a much more uh, polished quarterback uh, – much more advanced quarterback than Jackson Smolk was coming out of high school. Jackson Smolk uh, was very impressive in his freshman year, uh, by all accounts. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think the depth that Penn State is building at quarterback now with Prabila, with Smolk, with Grunkmeyer, um, very good depth. Best depth that they've had at that position under James Franklin, in my opinion. I'm with you, 100%. All right. Moving off him, uh, we can go on to our next player, which is offensive lineman Donovan Harbor. It looks like he wants to go by Donnie Harbor. Um, but Donnie Harbor, uh, six foot three, three fifteen, out of Wisconsin, one of three Wisconsin prospects to commit to Penn State here. Pick Penn State over Ohio State, Tennessee, and Wisconsin. This was a kid who was you know, even heavier a couple months ago. Penn State wanted him to drop a lot of his bad weight, and he did. He's down to three fifteen. I think he was closer to three thirty a little bit ago. Um, you know, four, I think we have a four M as a four star prospect um, on rivals. Uh, high upside guy here, you know, has some NFL bloodlines. His cousin, Brandon Brooks, played at, the, at Miami of Ohio and then also played in the NFL for a little bit with the Texans and Eagles. Was a very good offensive line for those who remember him with the Eagles and Texans. Um, and he is, uh, let's. Got to close all these extra tabs I have open. Let me tell you. Um, Donovan Harbor will be enrolled in the summer. Um, but, Marty, any thoughts on Donovan Harbor quickly? We have him as a three-star prospect. I do apologize. But three-star prospect, quality prospect, has has potential to grow into a very nice player for Penn State at, at a guard position most likely. Yeah, I think Donovan Harbor's a guy, if he if he can drop the weight, which by all accounts he started to do, and go back to the player he was a sophomore in high school, he could be a real steal for Penn State. You know, I, I think this is a guy who could <clears throat> be a starter down the road, really prove to, to be a potential steal for the Nittany Lions in this class. All right, moving off of him, we will go to our next uh, prospect, which is uh, one of the Biggest recruiting wins, maybe the biggest recruiting win of the cycle, defensive end Jalen Harvey. He will be enrolling early this um, upcoming January. Uh, Harvey, uh, 13 tack sacks as a senior, nine tackles for a loss, three touchdowns. Also had 12 sacks and eight tackles for a loss as a junior. Uh, four star prospect uh, here on Rivals, uh, but another kid that I think is being undervalued through the whole by the whole industry. Very similar build to Chop Robinson. Going to be a defensive end for Penn State. Was ranked as a linebacker for the most part. Picked Penn State over Florida, Maryland, and USC. But this is a guy, great athlete, fast, twitchy, really good first step. Um, I think this has a chance to be a really, 
really great pickup for Penn State. Uh, very high potential, very high ceiling. Um, I'm excited to see what he's going to be able to do as a defensive end. Like I said, very similar to Chop Robinson. I wouldn't be surprised if they turn out to be similar players in that regard, me too. Yeah, I'll just say Quince Orchard having both Jalen Harvey and Xavier Gilliam on their defensive line is just end game, game record type of stuff. That's just unfair for their opponents. But yeah, Jalen Harvey was the recruitment that dragged on and on and on, right? It was the one that you thought would be done about like 11 months before it actually was. But one that Penn State stuck with the entire time, never gave up, never um, wavered in if whether or not they wanted to pursue him. And it ended up winning the day. And I think Harvey's a guy that, yeah, he's got a high ceiling. I think he can contribute within this first couple of years on campus. Obviously, he doesn't need to contribute in year one because that defensive end room is still pretty strong. But I think there's a lot of potential there. And his first step off the line to me is is really, really good. I think he's a little underrated by a lot of the um, recruiting sites as well. Marty, thoughts on um, Jalen Harvey? Yeah, nothing more than Anthony added. I, I won't be surprised if we see Harvey on the field as a freshman next year, just making a splash play here there, the similar to Jamil Lyons this year. But yeah, I, I think Jalen Harvey is going to be a really, really good pass rusher for Penn State for quite a few years to come. All right, next up on our list is linebacker Kari Jackson out of Michigan. A uh, four-star prospect on rivals, pick Penn State over Cincinnati, Michigan, Michigan State, Missouri, and Wisconsin. Uh, will be a middle linebacker for Penn State, six foot one, two twenty, hundred three tackles, twenty six sacks for a loss, three sacks, and a forced fumble this season, as well as uh, sorry, last season, as well as six pressures as a quarterback. That was all on a quarterback. That was his junior stats. Um, yeah, I, I think you know he he fits the mold of what Penn State. Usually likes them middle middle linebackers, inside linebackers, or or Mike linebackers. Um, high IQ guy, maybe not the best of athletes at that position, but could be a guy that they trust to step into that position, kind of be a leader, be one of the leaders of the defense, and develop a a role in the defense there, the middle linebacker. Uh, and with Tom Allen, he, I, I expect Tom Allen to get the most out of him. Moving on to uh, the defense back room safety. Uh, Dijon, Dijon Lane out of the Gilman School in Maryland of Baltimore. Native, pick Penn State over Notre Dame, Maryland, and South Carolina. Four-star prospect consensus across the industry. Also a track star set the school record in the 4 by 100 um, Top 10 prospect in the state of Maryland here. He will be a summer enrollee. Card Jackson, by the way, a um, winter e- enrollee for Penn winter. Sorry. Kari Jackson in January and we're late, yes. Um, either one of you want to talk about Elena at any part? I think, I mean, this is a guy that I expect to step into that Penn State defensive back room and, you know, be able to make an impact. Maybe, I don't know, as a freshman, but as a sophomore, retro freshman potentially, I think he could go on to have a really nice career for Penn State. Yeah, I agree. I think Lane's a really good player. I think the biggest question mark for him isn't his ability, but what his position will end up being. Obviously, a big body kid around 6'2, 205 pounds. Right. Um, when, it, when you take Mother Nature into effect and how kids are going to grow and develop, um, the question becomes does he stay at safety or does he become too big and Mother Nature makes him more of a linebacker? I think he could have an impact at either spot. So I don't think it's necessarily a big deal either way. But yeah, he, he's a guy that you have time because that safety room is, is so, so good right now. It's so healthy. He doesn't need to step in right away and be an impact player anywhere. So let's see what happens with him, see how he develops, and, and figure out his position later on. But either way, you've got yourself a talented player. Any very quick thoughts, Marty, on um, on Lane before we move on? All right. Um, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you first tips on this one then, Marty. Uh, maybe the gem of the class for Penn State, four-star running back, uh, Quinton Martin out of Bell Vernon picked Penn State over Ohio State, Pittsburgh, and West Virginia. He will be on campus in January, named all state three times for class 3A, all Whippeal three times as a senior rush for a lot, almost 1,200 yards, 16 touchdowns, had 53 receptions for 764 yards and 11 touchdowns. Uh, production, production, production. He had production throughout his entire 
high school football career. Um, top 100 prospect here on Rivals. We had him, I think, top 60 uh, in his latest update. Um, I think the thing about Quinn and Martin is he's a damn good running back. I think he could make an impact in your one at wide receiver. I mean, this is a kid who could play multiple positions. I think you could put him out wide. He would do fine. You could put him in the slot. He would be fine. You could keep him in the backfield. He will do fine. Andy Colton Nicky has to be really excited about what he's getting. Quinn Martin, Marty. Yeah, I mentioned it before. I think I think Quinn Martin can be just utilized max potential in Colton Nicky's offense. You know, similar to what you see the 49ers do with the guy like Dabo, Debo Samuel move all, yeah. all over the field, backfield, wide receiver. I, I'm I'm super high on Quint Martin. I think he's a hell of an athlete. I think he's a hell of a football player. Um, I think he's a great career at Penn State. You know, he, he's a borderline five-star guy for a reason. You know, like you mentioned, Dylan, you put him in Andy Corden Nicky's offense, I think he do a lot of good things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see where this goes. But, uh, yeah, he, he might be my guy for highest overall potential in this recruiting class. Anthony, any quick thoughts on um, Quinn Martin? Yeah, I mean, listen, anytime you get the number one player in the state of Pennsylvania, you know, borderline five-star kid, that's, uh, that's a big deal. And uh, this was a guy that Penn State obviously was pushing for since he was a true, this is not true freshman, since he was a freshman in high school. You know, he was always a highly rated kid, always one that was on the radar as one of the top guys in the class of 2024. And, you know, if you're Penn State, that's one you, you got to get most years. And he, they were able to do just that. You know, I think if he's a makes... guy that he can play all over the field. Like, he, he's, he wants to be a running back, and I think he'll be a really good running back. But I still call him an athlete just because, you know, that running back room right now is obviously very healthy. Like Marty said, I think going into his first year, he really should try out being a wide receiver. You know, I think that's the best way for him to get on the field. Yeah, I was going to say, he may get more playing time at wide receiver. He would get more playing time at a wide receiver. But I mean, would. Go, going off the athlete thing, this is, this is also a kid that we were thinking maybe early on, he could also be a linebacker or safety for Penn State. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, no, no, definitely. He could play all over the place. And, you know, I think Debo Samuel is a great comparison for him. Just Jabril the Peppers coming out of high school too. Yeah, he could play both positions, and you can switch him back and forth. You know, and Colton Nicky, to me, is the perfect offensive coordinator to work with the kid like Quentin Martin. Nobody should be happier than Martin that Colton Nicky ended up being the hire because I think he's going to utilize him so well and play to all of his strengths. So, yeah, um, must get kid for Penn State from the very beginning, and they were able to do just that. No drama with this one. He was locked in from the beginning, and, you know, I think he's, you know, going to be the next great uh, hometown kid. Yeah, definitely has a chance to be really, really good for Penn State here um, in the future. We already talked about John Mitchell, but let me talk. Let me talk a little bit about his stats. Um, another kid that probably that I think we probably underrated, but that's okay. As a senior, tallied seventy-one tackles, six tackles for a loss, four interceptions, fifteen pass breakups as a senior. Um, but also a guy who has a lot of uh, pedigree. Uh, he has. Three brothers, all three brothers have played FBS football or have played uh, college football. Brother Justin at Harvard. Chris is now in Notre Dame after starting at FIU. Nicholas is out of Mississippi State. Moving on to our next player is Luke Reynolds, tight end out of uh, Massachusetts. Technically, Massachusetts plays in Connecticut. Big Penn State over Alabama, South Carolina, Kentucky. Four-star prospect here at Rivals. A guy who's really blown up since the spring. Uh, as a senior, 48 receptions, 754 yards, nine touchdowns. Um, Anthony, I, I think this is a kid who's going to have the ability to come in and make an impact at that tight end position, potentially as a true freshman. Um, it's going to be hard to keep him off the field just with how good of a tight end, how good of an athlete this kid is. Six foot four, 220. And he will be, uh, by the way, in rolling early as well yeah it was a kid that when penn state committed he, when he committed to penn state he wasn't even ranked yet and everyone yeah. was looking at it like well you know the tight ends have always been good so we'll see what happens here a little skeptical and, and then all of a sudden he just absolutely explodes on on the trail and just goes to camp circuits and just absolutely lights it up 
ends up skyrocketing both at rivals and, and all over the place, really. He's one and of the top think, prospects in the country now. What are you going to say, Dylan? I just, just overall with these guys, and, and this is why I, I never fret on any other sides for not jumping on a guy fast, is Reynolds and Grunkmeyer were two guys in the spring and uh, in the summer who really impressed in the camp circuits, right? They, they really blew up in the camp because of the camps and how they're testing, which is great. Testing is, is, is great. But if you can't do it on the field, I mean, it, it really doesn't. Man, I mean, the potential is there, but you have to show it on the field. Both those guys went out there this season and showed it on the field. And that's why they continue to skyrocket up rankings across the industry. That's all I got to say is that, that, it is one thing to do it in the spring, in the summer, when you're not wearing pads, not going up against a guy, a guy in pads on the other side of you. But they both answered the call this this fall, which I think is more important than anything they did in the spring or summer. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. But yeah, um, just the fact that he's you know exploded onto the scene and is now one of the top tight end prospects in the country, and he might not even be in a position to see the field right away, which is the crazy part because there's so many talented players in that room. It's such a stacked room right now. We'll see what happens, obviously, with Tyler Warren, if he stays or goes. But you know, that decision could have an impact on how much Reynolds plays this year, whether it's a little bit or at all. So, But either way, he's a guy that sooner rather than later will be on the field, will be making an impact, because he's just, he's just too good not to. Right. And um, what... what... With Luke um, Reynolds, Penn State's depth in that tight end position isn't dropping off anytime soon. That's for sure. Uh, that is a an embarrassment of riches for Ty Howe to work with. Uh, Marty, uh, any thoughts on Luke on Luke Reynolds? No, I think guys summed up well. He's he's a plus athlete, you know, right. elite athlete. Could he play next year? Maybe. Probably depends on what the room looks like. Um, Penn State some really even if Tyler Warren goes pro with Khalil Dingens, Andrew Rappel, yeah, you got some really good tight ends coming back. But uh, yeah, really, really good, really good evaluation by the staff to get in on Reynolds before he blew up. And uh, yeah, good eval, good landing. He should be really, really good for Penn State for multiple years. All right, moving on uh, to Garrett Sexton, offensive lineman out of Wisconsin, six foot six, two sixty. Believe it or not. This kid was playing quarterback up until like two years ago. Um, before, and I am two years, like a year ago. Um, but now he's an offensive lineman and to Penn State. Really high potential here. Um, at uh, Rivals, we have him as a, as a three-star prospect, but on the border of that fourth star. Um, and I think we may have one more recruiting update actually to go through. So there's still a chance he gets that four-star. Um, but... Anthony, I know you like Garrett Sexton a lot. Uh, any thoughts on Garrett, Sex uh, on Garrett Sexton? Yeah, I think Sexton has the potential to be the best player in this entire class. I, I really believe that wholeheartedly. Um, he's, what, six foot seven, 270 pounds, and he's still brand new to the, to the offensive tackle position. He was a quarterback for most of his high school career. Um, he was like, what, 200 pounds soaking wet at that point. And then he started to grow a little bit more, ends up deciding I'm going to be a tackle long term. I'm going to switch to tackle. And he's added like 60 pounds in the past year. And he can right. hold 310, 320 with ease probably because he's a really athletic kid. So he'll move well regardless. If this hits, me and Marty were talking before the show, if this hits and Sexton develops as he should, I think this has Olu potential. I really, really do. I know that's high, high praise, and it's probably unfair praise, but I really I, think his potential is that high if he develops as he could develop. I mean, and, and these are very high praises because both of these players have been, were in the NFL, two of the best at their position for a very long time. But you look at the Philadelphia Eagles, Lane Johnson, former quarterback, for a quarterback, I think at the JUCO level, became an offensive tackle for Oklahoma, turned into one of the best offensive tackles in NFL. Lane Johnson's been the best right tackle in football for the last five years. Um, and then you look at another guy who made a position switch, may have been a quarterback at one time. I know he's a tight end. Uh, Jason Peters. Jason Peters is an NFL Hall of Fame offensive tackle, and he was an offensive tackle until he got to. 
I think maybe even to the NFL. I think he was a tight end at Arkansas. Um, so, I mean, these position switchers has, have worked for four. Those are obviously two very extreme cases. But when you talk about that type of potential, which I think Garrett Sexton on always has that level of potential, but I think he has the potential that he this can go very much right for Penn State and he could be a future, you know, high NFL draft. Marty, any thoughts? No, I'm with Anthony. The um, I, I think he's high potential. If he hits, there's <clears throat> excuse me, the ceiling for best player in the in this class is there. You know, he he could be every bit the offensive tackle prospect Olu was, and then some. So the the, the potential is there. Really good get up and say, let's see if they can now mold Sexton into that uh, in, into that potential that he holds. All right, uh, next up, uh, by the way, Garrett Sexton is enrolling early. Next up, we have another Wisconsin Knight in running back Corey Smith, a summer enrollee. Corey Smith uh, picked Penn State over Wisconsin. 1,600 yards as a junior, 1,800 yard, all-purpose all purpose yards, 1,600, all, 1,800 all-purpose yards as a sophomore. Um, he suffered an injury this year, which kept his numbers short, unfortunately, or small, unfortunately. But a high potential running back, I, I think he's probably got lost in the mix because of that injury. But this is a kid. If he was the only running back in this class, Penn State would feel still really good about what they brought in at the running back position. Another kid who could probably go to wide receiver and see maybe not early as a true freshman, but I think he could probably see the field as a true freshman and wide receiver as well if, if he wanted to. Either of you have any thoughts on Corey Smith? Yeah, speedy, speedy back, shifty guy. Uh, definitely a little smaller than Quentin Martin, but he's faster. So they kind of balance each other really, really well in that regard. 5'10", 175, by the way. Yeah, I do agree that as a that as a slot receiver, he's very intriguing. Uh, I think Colton Nicky will, similar to Martin, have fun moving him around the offense and seeing how he can have the biggest impact. But again, he's not a guy that needs to have an impact in year one, probably won't right. have much of an impact in year one. But, you know, got to keep an eye on in a couple of years and see how he develops. 4-4 four, four speed. I mean, we're talking 4-4 four, four speed with Corey, Corey Smith. Um, Marty, any thoughts on uh, Corey Smith, or would you like to talk a little bit about linebacker Anthony Specka out of Pittsburgh Central Catholic? Uh, six foot one, two twenty. Pick Penn State over Michigan, Notre Dame, Pittsburgh. Led the team as a senior with ninety four tackles, seventeen tackles for a loss, five sacks, twelve pass breakups, one fumble recovery, two block field goal. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, really, really high production kid. Um, four star prospect, top twenty linebacker in the country. Uh, probably projects to an inside linebacker. A lot of a lot of college football pedigree in his family is. His father played college football. His uncle played college football. His uncle played college football. His aunt played college basketball. Um, his grandfather played college football. I mean, this kid lives, breathes, college, lives and breathes football. Any thoughts on Anthony Speck? I think he has a chance to be a multi-year starter for Penn State. Um, really has a chance to lock down that inside linebacker, Mike linebacker position uh, in, a, in a couple of years. No, all right, Mark uh, Anthony. Any thoughts on Anthony Speck? Yeah, no, I think he's a quality linebacker prospect. You know, he had I suppose like Michigan, Notre Dame, interest, pretty interested in him. So I, I think he's a guy in the middle that can end up being a two, three year starter. I think he's a smart player, um, more athletic than you'd expect, and yeah, I think he'll he'll be a really good one in the middle. Actually, I'm pretty high on him. D don't. Don't think you're hiding the fact that you just basically called him sneaky athletic. I don't think. I, I, all right, fine. You're gonna call me out, and I'll say he's more athletic than you think for a white guy. I'll just, I'll just say it in plain English for you. Um, you do it. That to, be honest, you to be honest, I, I don't. Have, I, I think that may be the first time we've we've talked in a cliche. I've we've mentioned a cliche in this whole podcast. Um, Actually, no, but no, but 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 you're you're. You're right. I mean, the one thing about him is, is people say he's more athletic than you think he would, he would be. Um, 
and uh, he is, I mean, six foot one, two twenty. He's, he's not a small kid. Um, he, yeah. he moves quite well. Um, might actually be a little bit more athletic than Kari Jackson, um, for what it's worth as well. Um, well, I think Kari Jackson and Anthony Specker together could be quite the nice middle linebacker duo for Penn State. But um, I have told people, I have been told by people that he may be the more athletic of the two. Moving on. Uh, safety defensive back, Vibu Torre. Either of you want to talk about him at all? Hard hitting safety. Um, I like him as a prospect. Those are always fun to watch. They are, yeah. I think he'll be an exciting player to watch. Um, but again, with the safety room, he's a guy more for down the road. But I think if he develops, he could be a really good starter here. Yeah, high productive prospect for uh, Irving 10, 90 tackles. Had a punt return for a touchdown, had eight rushing touchdowns. Had 89 tackles and four interceptions as a junior. Um, his cousin, uh, Kamoko Ture, played at Rutgers and then with the Colts and the 49ers in the NFL. Um, I have, uh, also, me, one of the guys in this class I have not heard anything bad said about him. Like, uh, apparently, Vabu Ture is one of the best people in this class overall. A uh, very humble person, I've been told. Um, defensive lineman Malachi Williams out of Monsignor Bonner and Archbishop Pendergast in Philadelphia. Big Penn State over Georgia, Notre Dame, six foot three, two twenty. Seventy tackles, twenty eight tackles for a loss, thirteen sacks, two forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and five pass breakups as a senior. I maybe some of the highest upside in this recruiting class for Penn State. Marty? <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the upside Williams is sky high. You know, he's not a guy you're, you're going to bank on making big plays as a true freshman in the fall. But I think, you know, two, three years down the road, he could be a really, really, really damn good pass rusher for Penn State. I really like Williams. Really good good get on the upside, like you said, Dylan. You know, two to three years down the road, he could be a really, really good pass rusher for Penn State. And I think we talked about it before coming on. Comparison for him, probably an Adisa Isaac type comparison. He has the, he has the length, he has the body frame, he has the twitchiness. Uh, with Deion Barnes, I think his ceiling is quite high. Anthony, any thoughts on Malachi Williams? By the way, Malachi Williams, a summer enrollee alongside Anthony Speck. I did not mention him. And then we're, for Boo Torre, he'll be an early enrollee. But Anthony, Malachi Williams, any thoughts? Yeah, if there was like a Garrett Sexton type of player on the defense, to me it's Malachi Williams in terms of they're both not ready right away, but their potentials are two of the highest in this class. Um, Malachi Williams is great burst off the line. Um, very quick. He's very light right now. I think he's around like 215 pounds, so he's going to have to put on some weight. So that's why he's not going to be ready to play right away. But he's he could be a force if he develops as he should and he could be a, a potential game wrecker off the edge I, i'm really high on him as well and that takes us to our last prospect um cornerback kenny Wosley jr out of uh Imhotep charter summer enrollee 23 tackles six interceptions seven pass breakups um as a senior um Big Penn State over Georgia, Michigan, and Rutgers. Um, you know, played one of the best high schools in Penn, in Pennsylvania. Four-star prospect here, um, as was Malachi Williams, by the way, um, and Anthony Speckham. Any thoughts, guys, here? I, I mean, this is a guy, high production, a little bit on the smaller side, 5'10", 165. He's going to need some time in the weight room. But I think there's enough upside here to, to be excited about the potential here. Terry Smith has done a great job with similar players. Um, and I think you combine his potential with Terry Smith's coaching history. There, there's a lot to work with here and a lot to like about Kenny Wosley. Hey, you're you're missing the most important part, though, which is Kenny Wosley was a hell of a kicker from Hotep this year. But no, in all seriousness, this is a recruitment where other schools made a late push. Penn State held on. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think Wesley can be a a, uh, a solid corner to nickel kind of back for Penn State down the road. Yeah, to me, he definitely projects as a slot guy because um, he's not the biggest guy. I think he's only around like what five ten, five eleven, but he's quick. 
Um, he's got good fundamentals. Um, I, like I said, I think you know the slot position could potentially be his down the road if he if he works for it, and I think there's potential there. All right, gentlemen. With that, that is Penn State's 2024 recruiting class. Um, give yourselves a round of applause for getting through that. I appreciate your help and assistance uh, with breaking this down. Any final thoughts on the 2024 recruiting class? Penn State could still add another uh, more prospects to this class before um, it's all said and done. There is the February signing window. Uh, but any thoughts on this class? Uh, we talked a lot about it before. Um, all right. Well, with that, let's move on to the last subject of the day. We'll, we'll briefly talk about it in five minutes. Penn State on uh, on Thursday, you thought recruiting was done. You thought we were going to take a little bit of a back seat, you know, enjoy the holiday season, relax after signing that. Nope. Nope. Penn State bounces right back into it on Thursday, at, Thursday morning uh, with defensive back Xavier Thomas out of Pittsburgh Central Catholic. 5'10", 160 pounds. Uh, this is a kid who's been starting at Pittsburgh Central Catholic since he was a freshman, which says a lot. If you're starting for Pittsburgh Central Catholic as a freshman, you're pretty damn good, and, and he is good. Um, I, I think I described him as high production, high ceiling player for Penn State, and I think the easy comp here, guys, is Daquan Hardy. 5'10", 160 right now. Um, that 5'10", may be generous. Um, Reportedly has a good speed. I think um, I saw somewhere around maybe four or five speed for him. Um, Marty, I, I I know you you wrote up his commitment piece a little bit here. A any thoughts on Xavier Thomas? Uh, like I said, 5'10", 160, out of Central Catholic. Uh, three-year starter, has been productive for Central Catholic in his three years there. Um, what What's your thoughts? A really good excuse me, a really good all around give for Penn State. You know, Central Catholic, that's a that's a state powerhouse, right? One of right. the best programs in the state. So players they are gonna be they're gonna be coached up. They can be ready to go. Um yeah, I like it. He he's a plus athlete, really good coverage skills. I know you and I talked about it before coming the air tonight. You know, the difference between him and a guy like Larry Moon. There's not a lot there. Um yeah, really, really good coverage guy with Penn State and uh yeah hopefully it's six Penn State lands him because this is a uh a potentially really really good get by Penn State in their recruiting class. Um Larry Moon by the way a twenty twenty seven prospect out of Central Catholic that you should absolutely keep an eye on. Absolutely should remember that name. I really believe he has a five star potential. Um Anthony, uh not sure how much you've been able to dive into Xavier Thomas, but High production on defense, 62 tackles, including 47 solo tackles just between his junior and freshman years. His sophomore year stats are not available on max preps, unfortunately. I could not find them. But through those two years alone, you're looking at 62 tackles. Um, so you're guessing closing in on probably 100 by now um, for his career. Four interceptions this past season, four as a freshman, but also a really good return man, a dangerous return man. Natural ability back there has NFL pedigree. His brother Rodney is with the Colts. Has been has started twenty four games last two seasons at safety and corner. Um, any thoughts on Xavier Thomas? Yeah, I, I find it pretty funny that on the day that DaQuan Hardy announces that he's going to the NFL, they get a commitment from a kid from Pittsburgh, which is where DaQuan Hardy's from who also projects very similarly to Daquan Hardy. They pretty much said, you're going to leave, all right, we're just going to make a new one. And that's, that's pretty much what they did. Thomas is a little bit bigger than Hardy, but all the things you described are pretty much what Hardy did. He was dangerous in the return game. You know, he plays really well in the slot. He's a playmaker. Um, I'm interested to see how he continues to develop. I haven't really had a chance to look into him much. Um, I was actually asleep when he committed, but... Um, I, I'm interested to see how he develops. I mean, we talked about Luke Reynolds and how he committed as, as an unranked kid and ended up skyrocketing. I could see Thomas on a little bit of a similar trajectory. I don't think he quite gets to where Reynolds was just because he doesn't have the size or the measurables. And sure. that's a big thing in rankings, but right. I could see him jumping up pretty big. And listen, if, if Terry Smith wants a corner, 
I want a corner. Like it's it's that simple. Terry Smith has earned the benefit of the doubt with these things. Right, and and the way I look at it is this guy's already had high production, um, and Terry Smith has done a good job for Penn State. Um, Penn State hasn't always taken the highest rated cornerbacks or cornerbacks in, in over the. I think Marty's computer died, um, but. Um, Terry Smith hasn't always taken the highest rated prospects at cornerback. He's taken prospects who's always had, you know, this one deficiency that has kept them from being that four-star, five-star kid. Um, and, you know, for Thomas, it may be that size, 5'10", 165. Is he really 5'10", or is he 5'9"? I mean, Daquan Hardy is listed at 5'9", but if he shows up at the combine at like 5'8 and a half, are we going to be shocked? Probably not. Um, so we'll find out what Xavier Thomas's true height is eventually. Um, and maybe it is five, but he's always taking guys who have a small deficiency here or there that keeps them from being that highly rated guy and then turns them into all big 10 caliber defensive backs. I think he's going to do that with Thomas. I think there's incredibly high potential with Thomas. I think the ceiling is high potential, even though he started for three years at um, Pittsburgh Central Catholic has played a lot of football. I think he's just scratching the surface of that ceiling for him. And, you know, I think he can be next in line of great Penn State cornerbacks under Terry Smith, um, and, and we'll see. But I, I, you add the return game aspect to it, it, it feels lazy, but Daquan Hardy really is the best comparison for him. I, I, I think he's a potential nickelback for Penn State here in the future. 100% agree. All right, well, we talked about a lot. We hundred and hundred an hour and 41 minutes here. Uh, so yeah, a hundred minutes, a hundred minutes of Penn state talk today uh, on the Penn state 365 podcast. I, I appreciate everybody who stayed with us throughout this entire podcast. Um, any final thoughts, Anthony? I mean, a lot to talk about. It's probably our final podcast. Uh, no, we, we have one more podcast before the peach ball. Um, obviously to preview the peach ball, I'll be honest, we probably won't break down the Peach Bowl until after it, uh, after New Year's, um, just because yeah. I'm travel. I'll be traveling to the game. Um, I'll come back 31st. I'm My mother lives down there with my, as well as my stepdad. So I'm going to be down there visiting the family um, around the holidays. Um, the podcast won't be my first priority. I'm sorry. But um, any final thoughts on, about anything we talked about today or anything we didn't talk about? No, it's been a busy month since we've been uh, we've been recording. It's been busy, but also slow at the same time in, in a weird sense. A lot has right. happened, but it hasn't all happened clustered together. Yeah. But um, Recruiting has been quiet. Yeah, recruiting has been super quiet un- until signing day, obviously. And I think that's which, by design. That's by design. I think which James Franklin. Franklin would like it to be. Yes. No, I don't think James Franklin is with the signing day drama like the Oregons and Floridas and A&Ms provide. So if you're looking for that, Trust what, me, no mer- not, you, not look at, you look at no, other no. teams, you will find it. Yeah, Maryland, perhaps. Um, <laughs> it, it's amazing, by the way, that Maryland always somehow flips some major kid right on signing day every every year. Listen, you'll never you'll never convince me that Maryland doesn't do that purposely. You'll never convince me because every year they do it. Every well, single year. Yeah, uh, I was gonna. Throw some shade at Alexa. But you know what? Maryland's turned into a quality program. They're just having – they're not – I don't know if they're ever going to get to that, you know. They are comfortably a second-tier Big Ten team, and I don't think they're ever going to enter that first year. Um, yeah, but I think you put them up. Um, but, yeah, with that, let's wrap it up. Hour 43 minutes of total content here today. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Penn State 365 podcast. Head over to the Penn State Rivals. Penn State Dow Rivals dot com to go to Happy Valley Insider. Subscribe to us. Free thirty day free trial. Get all the inside information on the field, off the field, inside lash, outside lash, everywhere in between. Uh, we'll have plenty of information going forward about the twenty twenty five recruiting class. I wrote up a nit bits today that has forty five prospects uh, names to watch in the twenty twenty five cycle for Penn State. Forty five, um, and one of those guys already committed. So um, we'll see what happens. But Penn State, I, I think I didn't mention it with Xavier Thomas. I probably should. Um, but a, with his commitment, Penn State now, close the tab, of course. 
uh, my luck. Penn State now with seven commitments in the 2025 recruiting class, top 10 class so far in 2025. Um, we'll probably see a couple commitments here in the next few months. Have a little quiet period, summertime, have another big you know run, and then uh, probably be quiet again throughout the fall. But that's how James Franklin likes it. James Franklin wants his recruiting classes done by you know the end of the summer uh, for the most part. And uh, that's what I expect to happen again in 2025. But until next time, everybody, thanks for listening to this podcast. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on Fair Podcast and Apps, Spotify, Apple, Google, um, wherever you are. Leave a five star review, please. Uh, leave a rating so you can uh, we can spread the word about this podcast. Share this podcast with your uh, favorite uh, Penn State fans in your life, your favorite loved ones, colleagues, whoever it may be, who love the Nanny Lions as much as you do. And until next time, everybody. Have a good one. And I don't think we're going to record and before the holidays. So enjoy the holidays. Um, if you celebrate Hanukkah, celebrate Hanukkah. Uh, I, I hope you had a nice Hanukkah. If you uh, celebrate Festivus, happy Festivus. Um, we, maybe we'll have an Aaron Agreements this episode. Um, but uh, that, that would be fun. Uh, but until then, happy holidays, everybody. Uh, Stay safe for the holidays, um, and we'll talk soon. Any final words, Anthony? No, we've had plenty of final words. Sign off. All right, well, everybody remembers who wished happy uh, holidays. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one, and we'll talk to you all real soon.